Adams. Um, so I want to uh, give lots of love. If you've been here before, you know her. Um, I adore her. Stand up, improviser, fantastic performer, Lauren McGibbon! We made it. We did it. We got to the end of the show. You gotta do your bit, so it's not over yet. Okay, well, uh, you have me to get through, yeah. and this is crazy. Um, okay, I'm gonna start this off by saying that um, looking at most of you, uh, our parents were baby boomers, right? For the most part. Okay, so uh, I, I used to think that uh, this experience was unique to myself, but at 28 I realized there's no such thing as a unique experience. So I don't think I'm the only one who spent my teen and 20s watching my baby boomer parents spend their entire lives as just one really long extended spiritual crisis. <laughs> um, like, uh, if your parents are a baby boomer, what that means is that they were probably raised on some form of Catholicism light, like diet Catholic, like Anglicanism or Episcopalian. So they learned from an early age that like Jesus hates everything that's fun, but there's no like crippling guilt that a Catholic or a Jew would feel about it? Well, not the Jesus part with Jewish people. I'm not that dumb. Um, but there's not like a lot of crippling guilt when they go against their religion, right? So they were raised with this religion and then they went to college. And then one fateful night they went to an Almond Brothers concert and did shrooms. <laughs> And they mistakenly assumed that the hallucinations they saw was like a higher truth from the universe. <laughs> when in reality, the chemicals in their brain tricked them into dreaming while they were awake. <laughs> and because that happened, they can no longer accept that religion and fun are mutually exclusive. When there is no fucking evidence to prove that that's true. Um, it's not true at all. Jesus hates fun, and he particularly hates sexy fun. Um, I want to, okay, let, let, and the, the best example, like this delusion, is, it runs so deep. You cannot convince them that the marriage of the two is impossible. Um, the best example of this is that I went to go see Brian Eno because the poster said Brian Eno live. When I see a poster that says Brian Eno live, I assume good music. Oh, how wrong I was. It was 90 minutes of Brian Eno talking about how for the better part of his adult life, close to 50 years, he had searched for one thing that encompassed drugs, religion, sex, and art. Say what? 90 minutes. He had pie charts, he showed his <laughs> art, he played some records, and he came to the conclusion that one, he hadn't found it, but two, he was confident he would. <laughs> Brian Eno is one of the richest, most famous people on the planet. He therefore has access to every part of the planet. And he still thinks he'll find it, but he won't. So my parents, much like Brian Eno, have searched for this their entire life. And it's always the same cycle. They find a new religion. They spend a lot of money on the paraphernalia. They are actively doing it for about three months. And then they realize that like all religions, there's a bunch of rules that say you can't have sex and do drugs. <laughs> so they move on to the next one. <laughs> they have gone through, if my memory serves correct, Buddhism, Qigong, Bikram's yoga, <laughs> kind of a religion, uh, sweat lodging, and by sweat lodging I mean they turned the second bathroom into a sauna and used it way more than doctors recommend, <laughs> crystal healing, Hinduism, tarot, astrology. Now, my mother, I think women specifically go through one phase. Men don't go through this phase, but women do. At one point, they turn into Stevie Nicks. <laughs> it doesn't last long, average 18 months, but it is by far the most hilarious of phases. 
strapping. Dream catchers, scarves, not using a purse anymore. It's amazing. And a part of the Stevie Nicks religion is that you get a group of other middle-aged women to join you in this. And uh, my mom's interpretation of that was to start a Monday night meditation group. So every Monday, a group of crazy ladies would come to my house, take over the living room, and meditate in a circle. Now, one time, hating Monday night meditation, I would always go for a run while they were doing it. And I was jogging, and I tripped, and I sprained my ankle. And I hobbled home and interrupted Monday night meditation group. But this was Monday meditation group's moment to shine! I got there, and instead of taking me to the hospital, they got around me in a circle and attempted to heal my ankle. <laughs> Which explains why, to this day, my right leg is shorter than my left leg and I have debilitating lower back pain. <laughs> so it was no surprise as I was perusing my mother's bookshelf that I came across Woman of the Word, The Arousal of the Inner Fire. Gonna let you know a little bit about the author. Lynn V. Andrews is the author of several accounts of her explorations into past lives and feminine spirituality, including, and I'm not making these book titles up, these are what these books are actually fucking called Medicine Woman, Jaguar Woman, and Star Woman. She is also the author of The Power Deck and Teachings Around the Sacred Wheel. Besides a writer, she is a mystic and shaman. Now, as I read this book, I want you to try and remember that this is published and sold as nonfiction. <laughs> Miss Andrews, this is reality. These, this, as much as I am talking into this microphone to you people as you sip beer and wine, this was reality. <laughs> Little backstory. What happens in this book is that Miss Andrews and her spiritual guides, who are native women from northern Manitoba, um, she goes into deep dreams and relives her past life as a medieval maiden. Oh! I'm not fucking making this up, and you will see. So let's start at the beginning, shall we? Finding a distant reality. <clears throat> there is a secret core in all of us, Agnes Whistling Elk said, <laughs> as she watched me fidget under her steady gaze. She had instructed me to come and discuss the next phase of our journey together. Why do I feel the sense of longing? As if I were trying to find my way home, I asked her. Agnes, Ruby Plenty Chiefs. <laughs> Ruby's apprentice, July, a young Cree girl. And I were sitting around a table in the far north of Manitoba, Canada. It was an early evening in spring, and the scent of young grass and pine was in the air. <laughs> July stroked the fire in the iron stove. Your evolution as an apprentice is like giving birth to a child. The longing you feel is the longing every woman feels for the unborn. Whether the unborn is a state of enlightenment, a life in the form of a baby, or a work of art, Agnes said as she sipped her tea. This experience is, this far memory that is in you, my daughter, is more than longing. It is part of the core of your existence as a human being. It is different from your other journeys. It is a source of another hope of existence. From your past. It comes from what you might call your spirit history. Now, she replies that she has been working very hard in her spiritual alignment and all of that. Because she says, finally, she heaved a big sigh. You are too much of the world, she said. Your teaching work in the greater Los Angeles area <laughs> has brought you too much in contact with other people. <laughs> but you're the one who said you must live in big cities. Where do you think healing is needed? 
defeated. Certainly not here in the wilderness. You must let the eagles fly and take what you have learned about the ancient way of woman and teach your people. The Real Housewives of Orange County. You must teach Britney Spears about the ways of the eagle. Oh my god. And then she goes, uh, you put me in the world, Agnes. All I wanted to do was stay here with you. I said, tears of frustration welled up in my eyes. It is true, Lynn Little Wolf. <laughs> we have given you a difficult task. Agnes laid her hand over mine. It is, it's difficulty. It's why we in the sisterhood must remain so hidden and secret because everybody knows the best way to keep a secret is to write it in a book <laughs> and then have that book published and internationally distributed. Okay, so um, quick summary. It's been a long show, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up pretty quick. But quick summary, what happens? They build her a dream lodge. She goes into deep dreams. She keeps dreaming that she is a medieval maiden. It is a very spiritual journey. She meets a teacher. This teacher's name is Grandmother. Grandmother teaches her that all you need to live in the world is to self-empower yourself as a woman. Or is it? Because she meets a knight named Charles and cannot feel fulfillment by leaving Charles. For she is in love with her dream man who only exists in her dream, P.S. He's not real. Uh, so this is the scene where they consummate their relationship. <laughs> <laughs> then he sat across from me, took both my hands. Try to remember this actually happened. <laughs> this isn't fiction. This actually happened. Okay? It's very romantic. <laughs> then he sat across from me, took both my hands and said, Tell me how you felt when we made love. Oh wait, oh fuck, I skipped ahead, sorry. <laughs> okay, forget that. And go. My eyes widened. What do you mean, Charles? You want to make love? The fog was forming gray plumes above us. Yes, that is what I said. But I thought you told me you could not take a wife. I could not make love to anyone before I take a husband. It would not be fitting. You are always a virgin to me. And when we have made love, you will still be a virgin. <laughs> a spirit. I want to show you one of the highest arts of magic and for her, perhaps then you can understand why I must always be alone. <laughs> Anyways, whether to always be alone yourself will then be your choice. It is up to you, but I want you to know about the alternatives. <laughs> He looked at me and I could feel him stroking my hair. My luminous fibers began to loosen and my spirit shield to fringe our past my physical form. We were completely surrounded in fog, as if it were covered by a veil. I felt as if we were, I felt as if he were caressing me, as if we were kissing my neck and my breasts. It was the first time that any man had ever touched me thus. He was wonderfully gentle, and I feel great love for him. I lost myself in my first sexual experience. It was as if I no longer existed, and he no longer existed. It was as if we were one, completely merged in body and being. There was no world. There was no fog. And there was no earth. I cared about nothing but beingness in his arms with our energy intermixed feeling the surge of the universe around us. I felt as if we had turned into pure energy and pure light. <laughs> when finally the light subsided and I came back into separateness, back into feeling alone, he carefully dressed me. He caressing my, me lovingly and with respect. I would never forget my first loving. I would never forget Charles. 
Then he sat across from me and took my hands and said, tell me how you felt when we made love. I was very shy. I laughed nervously at first. Then finally I was able to tell him about the extraordinary oneness I had felt. I admitted I had forgotten my body. And his. And felt a part of the stars. He said, that is it. What do you mean? I asked, surprised. That is it, he said. It is not akin to meditation. When you sit in meditation, when you do the practice that grandmother has shown you, it is not something like that. I thought for a moment and nodded my head. What? Yes, Charles, it is. I felt bliss. Grandmother, I know, has spoken to you about all of this. Can you imagine, Catherine, having the orgasmic feeling throughout a great part of your life? And then he says this, which is hilarious. Because he's a figment of her imagination. Uh, okay, you can attain what I have. Uh, okay, our spirits will never meet again like this in this lifetime. But you needed to know so that when someone does ask you to marry him, someone who can be a man for you, a husband, you will say no. <laughs> because all she need is her dream love. Uh, thanks for hanging in, you guys. Have a good night. What have we given? Oh, yes, so that's our show. Um, Show for hosting us. Uh, big round of applause for everyone who is on the show. You have uh, flyers and tell you who they are and everything. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, did you guys have fun? Yeah. We, we learned a lot, didn't we, this evening? Uh, and if anybody, you know, I, someone in the bathroom line was like, you really should have read the dolphin having sex part because I really want to hear I thought you guys were super creeped out. You're like, no, no, don't do it. So if you want to, and you're still here in like 10, 15 minutes, I'll read you the penis and vagina of the dolphin part. <laughs>